Uh, my name is Suraj Srinivasan. I am a professor at Harvard Business School, uh, and I am also the faculty chair of the Digital Value Lab at our, our DQ, Digital Data and Design Institute at Harvard. One of them, um, one of our kind of foundational uh, research agenda items for the lab is to understand AI applications uh, in finance. And that includes uh, inside the organization and in capital markets and you know, outside the organization. This assembly event uh, is for us to think about AI, especially uh, generative AI, uh, in the context of corporate finance, in the, in the context of how the finance function inside organizations are, um, are using uh, uh, generative AI, can potentially use generative AI, uh, or, or even AI more broadly. What will it take to succeed? What are the challenges? What risks? Uh, exist as these uh, opportunities are pursued. I'm super excited. My, we, we have three um, distinguished folks, uh, people who are in the trenches, so to speak, to share their thoughts with us. So let me do a quick round of introductions. Let me start with uh, Alexandra. Uh, Alexandra joins us from uh, uh, Alexandra joins us from London. She's a CEO of Evident uh, and co-founder of Evident. Uh, <coughs> She has a distinguished background, but I'll tell you the, the most recent, most exciting one uh, today that she, now that she's working on is creating an AI index. And, and right now at this point, it's focused on banks and it covers the largest banks in the world uh, to, to map how uh, large banks are adopting AI. And I know that this list of banks that is adopting is, is growing, a uh, uh, list of banks in her index is growing rapidly uh, and, and you know, through, the, through, through this year. Uh, so she's got a, a good insight into how AI is adopting is in financial services, especially in banks. We'd love to hear uh, from, from Alexandra. Um, my, my, our, our next plan is with Glenn, Glenn Hopper. Uh, Glenn brings two fascinating uh, uh, perspectives to this conversation. Glenn is a uh, practicing CFO. He's, you know, he's been a CFO in several organizations. So he's sort of deep in the finance function, has been an, uh, a finance executive leader himself. Uh, and... Glenn is uh, a techie. He's a, he's, a, he's a tech geek. He's a, uh, an AI specialist. He's written the book, um, as they say, on, on deep finance, corporate finance, and the information age. So how, how do these two come together? If you follow uh, Glenn on uh, LinkedIn, as I do, it is probably one of the best ways of keeping up with what's the latest uh, happening in terms of AI applications in finance and accounting. So have, pleasure to have you here, Glenn. Uh, our third Panelist is Sanjay Srivastava. Sanjay is the chief digital strategist at Genpact. Genpact is uh, one of the world's biggest uh, consulting firms, and they are, in fact, the biggest in the space uh, of finance and accounting um, support and, and um, strategies and consulting for, uh, for institutions, for companies uh, around the world. So for the topic that we're talking about, there's no one better than Sanjay who knows exactly what happens in these functions inside uh, inside the world's largest uh, company. So pleasure to welcome all of you here. Uh, I was going to first open it up uh, and, and we'll go with Glenn, Alexandra and, and, and Sanjay just to have a couple of minutes. Uh, I've given a quick introduction to you, but a, a couple of minutes from each of you uh, on the perspective that you are bringing given your, uh, given your backgrounds and the work you're doing um, and, and what you are seeing as some of the sort of the big uh, items uh, in AI and generative AI applications uh, in companies. Uh, let's let's start with you, Glenn. Uh, thanks, Siraj. Really happy to be here. Um, <laughs> I think with, for me, um, there's a quote, and I've seen it attributed to, uh, I think, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, probably Mark Twain and Shakespeare at some point, but this is sort of my origin story, and it is, the quote is, um, I always choose a lazy person to do a difficult job because a lazy person will find an easy way to do it. <laughs> and I, I mean, maybe not lazy, but trying to do more with less, trying to find a way to be more efficient. And that's really been a theme that has gone through my career and where necessity has been the mother of invention. Um, you know, my career path has been um, tied to tech because as an FP&A guy at heart, I've been on a career long search to find ways to automate the, the easier tasks and to build better financial models. So really coming up in my financial career, it's always been about what is the latest technology, whether that's 
building models in R or using Tableau or whatever the latest tool is that comes out, I've incorporated. So through that, um, that led me to the Harvard Business Analytics program a few years ago, which really fine-tuned my perspective. And um, out of that, uh, like you said, it, I sort of evolved into um, writing a book on the use of machine learning in finance and how to integrate in digital transformations of companies sort of led by the finance department. And um, so coming out of that, I've kind of been on the uh, on the preaching circuit about the the benefits and pitfalls of using AI and machine learning in finance. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Alexandra? Yeah, I, I have, I'm on that preaching circuit a bit too with the index coming, uh, being published in back in January. It is, um, so as, as you said, it is the, is the first public benchmark on um, AI maturity for banks. And we started with the first uh, 23 biggest banks uh, in North America and Europe, but we're expanding to 60 to deepen our coverage in in North America and Europe, but also looking at um, some banks in, in Asia and in the Middle East um, to, to sort of evolve the analysis. But really that comes from, um, I'm an economist by training, built indices my whole career, um, but got really stuck into the question of how you measure the strength of ecosystem, of AI ecosystems when we built the, the Global AI Index back in uh, 18 uh, and launched it in, in 19, which was the first sort of really in-depth measurement of national AI ecosystems that got used sort of by governments around the world to, you know, to track and monitor progress on AI development and deployment at a national level. And that led us down this, um, you know, this area of expertise, which is the measurement of, of sort of AI capabilities that we've then gone out and done for banks in the first instance, but we will expand across other sectors. And um, we we look at the things like talent, the whole talent stack, we look at innovation, we look at leadership, and then we also look at responsible AI. Um, and yeah, we'll talk more about sort of what we found and what the results were and who were in the top 10 and who were surprisingly not in the top 10. For having me here. Um... I, um, I really appreciate it. Um, I'll start by saying I'm not a finance executive, um, so I'm a newcomer to the field, but um, it's important to understand my biases and perhaps the knowledge base. So at Genpak, we serve probably a third of the Fortune 200. Uh, we're focused around very large corporations across the globe. And we, I think consulting is probably, um, uh, actually the way to say it is we don't necessarily just provide ad advice. When we work with um, our clients, we actually take our business processes and we run it on their behalf. We'll transform it as a chief digital officer, apply the data and the tech and the AI components to actually digitize it and transform it. And then uh, in many ways, we're the operator. Uh, we actually operate those processes. And obviously in finance and accounting, we've done that for many years, decades, actually. Uh, so um, a little bit of my experience and perhaps a little bit of my knowledge comes from the fact that we serve many companies across many industries, from banking to consumer goods, from life sciences to insurance, from industrial manufacturing to high tech. And um, across that, we see lots of best practices. And frankly, to be honest, just internally, lots of bruised knees, lots of skinned elbows and all the things you go through when you apply digital transformation. Um, the other part, in the startup ecosystem. So I spent a lot of time with uh, early stage startups now, particularly in the generative AI space, uh, as a venture investor, as a board, um, and also as a mentor. And uh, previously came from a background of entrepreneurship. So I built four startups and we all exited to different uh, great companies and brilliant homes. And so a little bit of my bias is around emerging technologies and how they're eventually going to impact um, the things that you and I do. Uh, one thing I'll say, I know we've got a full conversation started, maybe going back to, I think, Glenn, your comment about quoting someone else. I think the quote that comes to mind is, and I think it's true for this, I think generative AI and specifically, and I'm narrowing it down just to generative AI, I think we're likely overestimating the impact in the very, very near term, but we are clearly, definitely, definitively, absolutely underestimating the impact it's going to have in the long run. And so this is a top agenda on pretty much every board that I know of. And so I'm happy to be to be here for that discussion. Hey, Sanjay, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with you for the moment and then do the reverse order. Um, on, on Given, you know, through Gempact, your startup uh, work and, and your advisory work and so on, what are, what, what are things that you are finding most interesting? Uh, just, you know, a couple of uh, uh, promising applications of, of generative AI in this field, in, in finance accounting area. Yeah, I think there's going to be a step one, step two on this, uh, Suraj. You know, so I think right now what we're seeing 
three amazing use cases or generalized use cases. The first one is the simple notion that, uh, and by the way, I, was, I started my, my education learning Fortran and Hobo, so you can kind of date me very quickly. Um, but really the next programming language is English. And what that is doing is it's transforming the way we think about automation and business and analytics. And one of the things we're able to do is actually express a question in natural language, in English in this case, and that'll automatically generate AI automatically converts into SQL, runs it across the database, comes back with the data points, puts it into a narrative and brings it back. And you think about the traditional life cycle in a large corporation where you know business user, business analyst, you know, programmer, coder, QA, and then all the way around tripping back in that circle. What it does, it it not only makes it much more efficient, but you're lot, but you're able to interrogate the data and you're able to sort of ask the questions that didn't come to mind. And I think that's making large. So that's a great example of generative AI. We're using that today, but you know, across that around narratives and reports, around synthesizing credits and uh, and 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 risk positions, um, around uh, things like um, you know, in transactional finance, we do a lot of work around supporting clients clients around accounts payable and accounts receivable, and those incoming questions come in using conversational AI. So, so I think what, what we're seeing is right now in the short term, we're seeing some really great uh, use cases. But the point I want to make is, you know, on my view personally, at least, uh, is that generative AI is not a, um, it's a systemic change. And by that, I mean this, uh, you know, you go back and look through history and you think about mobility and just, you know, look, think about our, our mapping software on our phones. And when that first came around, I, I know there's a study that was done in London. Alexandra, you're in London. And you'll know this, um, you know, the London black cabbies actually have to go through extensive training to be able to be certified to be who they are. It's actually three years of training. They have to go and answer questions like the Tuesday after Christmas, you're going from Pancreas Station to, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, to uh, a restaurant. And what's the best way to take? And so you really have to be familiar with the streets. Um, you know, uh, when the first applications came out as a point product, what ended up happening is, you know, they, they ran a test across cabbies that had been on the streets of London for 10 years plus and those that had been on the streets 10 year minus. And they just measured efficiency, which is an economic measure. But the idea is as a total percent, as a total number of hours that the cab was available, what percent of the time was actually being in a fare or being used, if you will. And so you measure that before and after and can you figure this out? And it turns out that for the group that was less than 10 years experience in the streets of London, it improved the productivity by 7% or efficiency or utilization, if you will. And that was a good number, but it's actually a point product. It helps a specific sub-segment of the population in a way that is beneficial for them but it's very narrow. You know, fast forward to where we are, and we're all used to using great ride hailing and ride sharing and Ubers and the lifts of the world and so on and so forth. And what that has done is completely different, right? So now um, it has brought the capability of a, of a driver, a Lyft driver, or Uber driver to the same level as this three-year certified black yeah. cabbie driver in London as an example. And on the back of that, if you think about it, and we're talking finance today, you know, I think there's like three and a half million Uber, maybe another, so you know, let's say three, four million drivers now on the streets. Let's say the average value of a car is about $25,000 is round numbers. That's about hundred billion dollars of capital that just got infused into this limousine taxi drive industry. And that happened on the flip of technology. And so uh, that's a systemic change. That's not a point product. That's not a specific application for a narrow niche segment. It actually fundamentally changes the way work is done the way you and I actually interact and use transportation and mobility. And so, you know, in many ways, I think the opportunity for corporate finance is in the short term, we can apply all these things and kind of really kind of sort of get ahead. But actually in the long run, it's going to change the game and it'll be a systemic change. Glenn, uh, could you jump in with what you are seeing as some of the interesting uh, use cases now coming up? Yeah, um, I think I think in this audience, probably, you know, because of the nature of our conversation here, this more people in the crowd here would have read or at least be familiar with the uh, Bloomberg GPT paper. Um, I was very excited when that came out thinking, oh, this is going to be a great tool. But, but then as you get through the paper, you realize that's they're not publicly releasing that and they're using. So it's a for those who aren't familiar, Bloomberg GPT was a fine tuned model on the however many <laughs> uh, billions of pieces of uh, uh text that um, Bloomberg has, their proprietary information. And that's a great application. And I think we'll see more of that. I, th I think we'll see more domain-specific, fine-tuned models. Um, but here's, and I'm I'm advising a couple of startups right now that are uh, trying to integrate ChatGPT into their products. The generative AI is, as a foundational model, like Sanjay said, it is the new programming language is going to be English. So it's going to open up a lot of possibilities, but the inherent 
capabilities of an LLM are not, you know, it's not math. It's it's generating text and interacting with humans. So I think products that are built off of this, it's going to require interaction with, um, you know, whether it's fine tuning or vector embeddings, reading, uh, you know, SEC guidelines and uh, and and all that. Um, but I think that where we're moving is going to be when you can have sort of a, a chat bot and uh, an accounting and finance assistant who can look at your own documentation and interact with that. A couple of the startups I've talked to are trying. So if you're trying to analyze financial statements, the crazy thing with doing that with um, an LLM is you have to convert numerical data into text then you have to <laughs> vectorize it, turn it into you know these vector embeddings, and then interact that way. So that's very computationally expensive, and it's not efficient. So I think we're seeing very early on, okay, this is how we're going to interact with them, but there's going to be tools that are built off of it. And right now, and I'm going to throw it out at the beginning, and I may repeat this <laughs> later in the panel, don't put proprietary information into the online chat GPT. <laughs> I think we would all agree with that. But there's going to be interfaces that let you interact in a secure environment with your own company's data. And I think right now I'm seeing some novel approaches, but not anything that, with the exception of maybe some of the stuff that Microsoft is rolling out and not to show for one company over another, but it, enterprise ready interaction with these LLMs, it, it's not there yet for most people. And that it seems like is a is probably, uh, again, some, some, some estimates I saw, all of OpenAI's training uh, was on, you know, 3% of information that that exists in the world, which is you know public available. Most information is behind uh, enterprise walls. So, uh, both in terms of actually the training information itself, plus but but applications uh, are uh, will, will have to be geared uh, towards that. And how we do that and and maintain privacy of information if you're doing doing it across. You know, to your last point, Glenn, I think it was Samsung, which uh, when 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 they found that some of their uh, uh, employees was. Uh, we're, we're, we're putting in like meeting information into chat GPT to get a summary um, of it. But these are all confidential sort of internal proprietary information they were putting in to, to, to summarize. But now it becomes part of the open kind of universe. So uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you manage the inside confidential proprietary nature of things while, 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 uh, while, while doing this? Um, <clears throat> uh, Alexandra, maybe you can pick up the same question. Okay. But then we're already, I think, starting to talk about, the, you know, what should organizations have in place uh, to succeed? Uh, you know, what what skills and uh, what what capabilities do we have to uh, have in place? So, so please pick up this the same question of what are the interesting things you're seeing. But then, if you could take us also into, therefore, you know, what what are you yeah. seeing in terms of readiness or capabilities that are needed to be successful? Yeah, I think everyone's grappling with that question. But just to pick up on the sort of the difficulty and it's not just a plug and play to both what Sanjay and, and Glenn were saying. It's not just, we'll just pick it up, buy it and then plug it in. I mean, doing using uh, these large language models on internal data has to then be trained on internal data. And it seems to me that the banks that I've spoken to who are sort of really, um, I mean, every bank is, is grappling with this, but there is sort of a bit of a whack-a-mole game going on as in, you 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 use it on the internal data, but the internal data hasn't been labeled or tagged uh, yet properly. And therefore, when you run your large language model on it, it can throw up some 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 you know quirky responses. And it's not because the language model is you know it has been fixed for hallucinations and so on. But it is a question of the underlying data is just not quite there yet. And so there's a lot of content management that needs to be done. So in terms of what well, you need to have of rails um, ready for the large language models to run on. Um, and, and there probably will be tools you know, that can that can fix a lot of that. And I'm sure that that's you know, already coming coming on board. But, but that is, um, you probably all, all, all read that piece, um, the interview with Jeff McMillan. I was just in New York and talking to them and his team about their use. They um, onboarded uh, ChatGPT just when it came out, but that's because it was resting on a, uh, a two-year partnership that they had struck with. So this is Morgan Stanley, Alexandra? This is Morgan Stanley with, with uh, OpenAI and Microsoft is in the public sphere. There's some great articles around this, but but even with a long uh, sort of two-year partnership and really thinking about getting that content in place, there's still 
just a, just a, still a lot to do. Um, and so when it was uh, released and they put it, you know, put it in place, they're just, you know, you know, them, but but everyone else grappling with this feedback loop and testing and fixing and so on. So while there's an enormous amount of promise in large language models, and I think that Sanjay, that point about this is going to be completely transformative, absolutely, and it's going to make um, financial advisors and many, many other uh, people and functions and banks 20, 30, 40% more efficient for sure. But I think it's going to take a while before we get there because there are there's a lot of testing and that's just on internal data. So, you know, and there's a phase where that needs to be tested before it's let loose on anything that is interacting with customers directly and using um, data that is private. So there's a whole question around how you build your walls and what you use for that and so on to keep, um, you know, um, data privacy requirements, uh, in, you know, uh, aligned with those requirements. So, I mean, so it's interesting because I also do think that the, um, release of the large language models now is probably exposing the banks somewhat. I think there is this gap you're seeing from those that are maybe not quite as far in sort of generally, you know, figuring out the infrastructure plus having the talent in place plus um, partnerships and and so on in the banks. And those that are quite far, those that are quite far advanced are it's still you know complicated and they're grappling with it but they have a lot of talent in place they've thought about their infrastructure for a long time and even then it's quite difficult if you haven't embarked on this journey and got most of those aspects in place of that ecosystem you know that it's that you know that might just widen the gap between those that are nascent in thinking about this versus those that are really far along in the AI adoption journey. So I, I worry a little bit about maybe a gulf between the banks um, and, and how that might look and how that might affect, maybe not in the next three to four years, but definitely in the next five, six, seven years. So that's so, so the gap would grow. Sanjay, go ahead, please. Well, I was just gonna, I was just gonna go back to something um, that was said earlier and maybe provide a slightly alternate perspective on in the sense that uh, you know, we can debate this out together. Um, so by back, uh, just for background, I mean, we've been in uh, AI for a while, over five years now. We started with small language models and kind of worked our way up through this uh, and so forth. And um, the amount of, the pace of change that we're seeing, the amount of innovation that's happening, not on a monthly basis, not even on a weekly basis, literally on a, you know, in days mm -hmm. is amazing. And so I started six, nine months ago with a lot of concerns around data privacy uh, originally, um, and, and 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 a number of issues that come after that. But I just want to say that the technology challenges, you know, box after box are getting ticked off. Like, I think uh, there's ways to interact. Like, for instance, if you go through the API on uh, OpenAI as opposed to the quote unquote chat GPT, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's different, uh, there's different um, uh, rules around how your data is going to be used. If you use, for instance, uh, to refer to the vendor that, uh, micro, uh, that uh, Glenn was talking about, Microsoft's uh, 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 Azure OpenAI service, then actually you're within a four firewall. So I think the data privacy issues for, for the most part is off the table in the sense that your data won't actually leak. And I think the other issue that came up was actually IP leakage, right? Because when you ask the questions, you end up training a large language model in, in, the, in the domain that you're in. The next person that comes in asks the question, they get the value of all of that stuff. And so now I think we're at a point where we're actually even able to shield that and our data does not train the publicly available LLM. And I just think, you know, as we work our way through it, a lot of these like hallucinations, my God, the drop in hallucination rates in like, the four. last three weeks, in the last three weeks, it's mm -hmm. night and day. Um, the, the other side of the coin though is, I know there's so much focus on the word generative AI and I feel like it's one of many tools in the toolkit. It's kind of like we just invented the screwdriver for the first time in our lives. And all along we were trying to use the wrench and the plier and the hammer to wrestle that nail, the thing that was a nail or a screw. And we didn't know quite what to do with it. We worked around it. We cut that block of wood out and use something else and so on and so forth. And now we have it and all the focus is on the screwdriver. But actually it's best used when you combine it with other AI and ML and other automation capabilities. I'll give you one example. Um, uh, it's a it's a sales for so back to finance. It's a sales forecasting scenario, and I think one of the best use cases I've seen is actually applying um, looking at the email threads between our, between salespeople and their clients, right, and running it through an AI engine. And what generative AI has done for the first time is allowed us to think about intent and emotion and labels 
at a level that we weren't able to previously do just by running it through an AI engine. And so that because it's so good at language and it's so good at understanding uh, that synthesis in the context of language, I think it can draw a lot more insight. But once you have that, you still run it in an ML model. You still apply extraction and other AI technologies to be able to parse the data. You still apply other techniques. And so the point is the end product, which is a sales forecasting engine that's based on email communication with your salespeople and your clients, uses generative AI. It's kind of a screwdriver that sort of that brought the last piece of the puzzle, but actually uses the rest of the toolkit. And I just think it's important to keep that in mind because so much of the attention now is on quote unquote generative AI, but actually it's just one tool in the toolkit. It's just one tool. That's that, that's a great point. Uh, <clears throat> Anjay, I want to pick up a question that came, but there's a question by Miran who says, can you tell me more about the data privacy being off the table uh, because it is still being run on third party uh, generative AI. So why 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 is it off the table? Yeah. So first, first things. Uh, I mean, and I'll give you a very quick answer. And happy, by the way, Miran, if you want to just, uh, if you want to link in with me, and we can pick this up. But just very high level, at least our journey and what we learned. So the original issue was we're going to put, you know, to the example someone was giving before about Chat GPT and putting information on there. Like that was the first and the first challenge, right? And so one of the first things we did as a company is we set up a policy. And it's an important decision for most companies to make. It's not intuitively obvious because you have to draw the balance between, as a culture, how much you want to embrace it, and then as a security posture, how much do you want to restrict it. And every company is going to end up with a different answer, but we took a very lean in uh, step forward approach of saying we want everyone, 110,000 employees to actually engage in it, but we want to do it in a very meaningful and purposeful way with guardrails in place. So we set up security and, 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 the, and kind of the envelope so that we wouldn't end up um, you know, sort of giving away data, but actually we would get our business users more familiar with it. Because by the way, all of the advancements we're going to see is going to come at the business side. It's the it's now the ability for business users to do that. So that's one. But I think the next thing was when the data goes to a third party provider, what happens to it then? And then, you know, different uh, providers are there and you can walk down the list from Google to to uh, open AI and, and sort of make your own assessments on how much you trust in, uh, but, but they all have SLAs now. And as an example, OpenAI, which is the, which is the you know, compared to Microsoft, Google, et cetera, uh, even they have now a policy statement. So if you use the API as an example, your data will not be used to train their models. Um, and so there's components there. And then you take it to the next step and we sort of played around with this, which is fundamentally, when you do things like enterprise search, you, you're applying generative AI to go look into a piece of data and extract the answers back. And a lot of that can be firewall within your environment. So you just get the large language model and you put it across data that sits within your firewall. So there's no leakage there. The other half of the problem is actually the narrative that comes from the back end of it. And that's where you actually have to go outside to be able to deploy it. But there's technologies now like vector, uh, uh, um, a virtualization or tokenization. And what it does is it picks up the sensitive pieces of information. It tokenizes, it replaces it with something else. So it'll replace the name Sanjay with one, two, three, nine, six. And then it'll send it out. It'll generate the narrative. It'll come back and then it'll replace it back. So th I'm just saying there's a lot of detail here, but this is a top issue around a pervasive deployment of, uh, of GPTs in plural. And I think this is one of the issues that actually literally is off the table. Early stages, a lot of more work to be done, but I wouldn't be as concerned about data privacy if you're taking the right steps on it. And that probably will become a, a, a business opportunity. Now, a, a large Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley can, can train it sort of internally, but when you go start going to like mid-level companies, you're going to have to need, you, you can't just train things on, on the, the scope of data that exists. So you're going to have to use sort of outside uh, inside uh, and, and somebody is, you know, Rudra Singh has mentioned also that the the idea that you just now mentioned, uh, Sanjay, which is, you know, you can you can anonymize it on the way out and then use it back on the way in. So you know, some some ways of making it uh, making it generic. And, and this again, the, the health data will have the will have a similar issue. Glenn, so may, may, maybe bringing it to to you. And there's also a question from Marcelo. Uh, a, a lot of work in corporate finance is forensics, and and to sort of bring bring your bring it to your question that that you raised Glenn about you know numbers and numbers have to get transformed into words and then back into numbers um so given that things like uh, uh, uh fraud detection and, and forensic analysis and all that is a key uh, a use case in accounting and finance how do you how do you do that given the current limitations and, and what are you seeing yeah we we mentioned earlier how llms are just one slice of you know, there's artificial intelligence, machine learning, the smaller circle will be deep learning, LLMs are one type of deep learning. Well, they're also, LLMs are only one type of generative AI. There are actually other generative AI tools that I think are 
more suited for fraud detection. For example, um, thinking about um, a uh, like a, a an auto encoder, like a variational auto encoder, where you can uh, not to get too technical on, on what they do, but basically for fraud detection, you could run you know however much data you have of normal transactions through this algorithm and then run actually you know, and train it on these are normal transactions and then have uh, run actual live data through. And if the auto encoder can't reconstruct something that looks like it is um, like the transactional actual data, then it flags it for fraud. So um, fraud detection is one, an LLM not designed for that, but other plenty of other machine learning algorithms are. The autoencoder is just one. Um, I think that other applications, I mean, that's the crazy thing. People have, I mean, thinking back to spam filters, uh, Netflix and um, Amazon's recommendation engines, the way that we, all this AI and machine learning has been out there for years, and it just really hasn't been real flashy or sexy, but now there's chat GPT that people can talk to and they're starting to focus on it. So. I think that really, and it goes back to, and I'm, this is a, a drum that I keep beating, is when you have this foundational model, and again, to Sanjay's point, when you can speak to it in English, this is going to open up so many doors. And this is before the plugins to chat GPT are even out there. And it's going to be, you're going to be able to build so much off of this that it's, instead of having to know how to write a machine learning algorithm or a, you know, whatever, a Python script to do what you want, you'll be able to just plug it in again with our proprietary data concerns. But I think that the real, going back again, the hype right now, we're sort of at the peak of inflated expectations in the, in the Gartner cycle. I can't wait to see 2023's version come out from Gartner because um, we've already blown away the 2022 one <laughs> that they put out on the AI hype cycle. But I, we're, everybody's seeing the potential here, but it's how you tie it all together and how you apply it. So will the will a large language model itself be the tool that's going looking for fraud detection? No, but it will interact seamlessly with the other tools and algorithms that do. Glenn, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with you and then maybe uh, Alexandria on that, on that question or two. There's an, another one here. You, you started talking about this and given your CFO experience, there's a question by Hemi Tope here on... Uh, can, can, can we start getting some insights on how CFOs can leverage AI for business growth? Uh, so fraud detection is one use case, business growth, you know, revenue uh, uh, generation and, and so on. What, what are you seeing? Where is the potential? So one of the first projects I did with ChatGPT was I built a tool where I was not going to write a single line of code, um, but it was basically, let me take these three years of financial statements dump them into a database and have um, have ChatGPT, well, ChatGPT wrote the code to build the databases, import the CSVs, and then I just had it write um, Python code that would go through and look for correlations, look for trends. And I think about, you know, we've been talking about digital transformation for what, 30 years? As, as long as I've been in the corporate world, it, it, we're constantly transforming. So, um, in thinking about the move to data-driven decision-making, a, a big speed bump in that is how long it takes for internal teams today to be able to process the data. So you've got, you know, there's great dashboards out there. You, you can get at a glance work, but for a team of data scientists to go do that deep dive still takes time. Well, LLMs are gonna change that so that you have instant access and it's democratized access as much as you wanna make it available in your company. So being able to make these quick decisions on if you're seeing a trend, you know, where your cost of goods sold are going up and your, but your revenue is not, and maybe, you know, and that's one thing that, that programs are great at is, is spotting trends and patterns and, and variances. So having access to that information early is what's gonna help fuel the bottom line. And I think, and that's a big push for the whole finance and accounting department is where we've historically, we've had so much of our job has been in data entry and crunching the numbers and all that part of it. Now, if we can reskill and upskill our teams to take them away from those mindless tasks and put them on that value add position of let's quickly analyze the data, find results, be more strategic. That's what's going to contribute to the bottom line when you can identify those trends in as near real time as you have access to the data. Uh, Alexandra, maybe maybe you can pick up this question uh, too on 
um, on uh, growth. How do you how do you drive growth if you're if you're a CFO uh, or what you what are you seeing in in banks as using AI for business growth? You know, where where especially if you think about the the, the CFO's role, where are some opportunities? Yeah, I think I mean I think but I think Sanjay and Glenn have covered sort of all of the many of the areas that are really really interesting potential you know lots of value creation in it um growth is also about savings and efficiency gains it's about using um the llms uh for revenue uptake in terms of better products and sort of hyper customization and you know synthesizing of documents to you know being just more precision and more efficient and that's what it's going to do but i actually i actually have a question if i may sure, ask sure. Uh, <laughs> because um i so glenn something that you said that sort of i was curious to get your your take on is what what we're tra we're tracking a lot of the hiring in the banks real time we've got you know we we mine a lot of data you know, on LinkedIn, on job descriptions, on announcements of mm -hmm. hiring announcements. I'm watching this right over the last couple of months. And it's interesting to see, I was expecting to see um, JDs go out on specific things that were related to generative AI um, implementation. And I'm not really seeing a change. And I'm just wondering, what do you expect to see in terms of the change of the talent profile in the banks that are uh, needed to be there to capture and implement at speed LLMs. Is the innovation going to come from startups and uh, and, and sort of vendors, you know, people, else, or is it going to come from the large, you know, banks and large, uh, large, large enterprise, you know, uh, uh, large companies, um, or it's you know, it's a combination of both. But I'm just curious of what your prediction is, or at least what you're seeing. Uh, right now, given sort of the legacy issues that might be hampering these larger companies. But Glenn, what, what, what are you seeing and what will you advocate on that? Yeah, so in, in the question is where it's going to come from. I am seeing a lot of really promising startups right now. The issue with a startup and AI right now, you, based on LLM, is building a moat. Because if this is, if everybody is using the same foundational technology, whether it is GPT or BERT or, you know, whatever the other language models that are out there, if you can go and build something that that's at the core of it, uh, you know, OpenAI could, or Microsoft could, in the snap of a finger, knock out what you're doing, unless you have a really unique way of, of handling something. And the technology is moving so quickly that what you build today to interact with other documents or other, um, you know, company information outside of what the model was trained on, it could get knocked down in a moment's notice by one of these giants in the industry. Um, as far as hiring right now, we're not, I'm not seeing a shift in hiring. Uh, you see a lot of people talk about the value of being a prompt engineer. And I think that there are ways you can make, you can organize prompts better. But I think in a very short amount of time, saying you're a good prompt engineer is going to be like saying, I'm really good at Googling. So it's that's a that's another one that doesn't really have a moat. So I think that the fundamental shift, the underlying shift, and I've been preaching this for years, and it's true not just of finance and accounting, but I would say any industry, as AI moves up the chain and knocks out more of this sort of repetitive and and, and mindless type work and, and moving up beyond just mindless and doing more mm -hmm. tactical and strategic work, that the way that that what I'm going to be hiring for is someone who understands the technology behind it. Now, does that mean every finance person needs to be a data scientist? No, but if I had a data scientist who also knew finance or a finance person who also knew, had a, a working knowledge of, of analytics, that would be really high on my list because I think, uh, Siraj, one of the questions we talked about mm -hmm. is, you know, sort of how this changes. And I think this is maybe before we came the, on, the but how this yeah. changes workforce. And I think that that skill, you know, I don't think that there's any job level that can't be replaced. And I, and I get a lot of pushback on this, but not today, but in the near future, it's it's hard for me to pick a job that couldn't ultimately be replaced by AI. Yeah, I, can I can I just, sorry, Serge, can I follow up on that? I think, um, I mean, one of the hypotheses, we're, we're, we're going to be releasing a big talent report end of month. So it was a really 
that's why it's talent and hiring and all of that is, is top of mind. But we're also just looking at, you know, when you look at the density or the proportion of data scientists to the, um, you know, employees is, it's just, it's rough, right? But it is, you know, that varies a lot in banks. And, you know, is there a link between fast adoption of LLMs and that proportionality that's high, if it's high, um, if that's going to be correlated to high uptake? Because from what you're saying, Glenn, is, you know, someone with data science skills is good, right, in this instance. And it is to understand, you don't need to be a you know, uh, deep in the weeds of uh, large language model development, but you need to understand how it works in order to implement it. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna just to bring this last part to a close, and I'll get into the question you asked. Uh, look, uh, I hate to do this, but I'll just give you one minute, to, two minutes, very quickly. Thirty years ago, four, five, five people used to get together every Friday, last Friday of the month. I just picture this in your head: old diner, donuts, coffee. Friday mornings, eight to five, uh, eight to twelve. And they sit down and basically what they were doing is they're the five leaders for the five parts of the geography of the United States. And there were sales leaders that were figuring out the sales forecast for next month and the month after that. To the people in the room, just fantastic at listening to clients. They'd be coming with inputs like with the temperatures going up in Cincinnati or, you know, there's a Super Bowl game that's happening here or something or the other. And these are our competitors releasing this. So really brought in great insights from the market. Two of the people in the room were fantastic at arithmetic. 30 years ago, you know, they sit around the table and they say, well, this is going to happen. It's going to change it by this percent. And these guys would just calculate the numbers in their head. And it's like, boom, they'd have the number right there. And it was such a productive environment because you had a couple of people that brought in all these kind of market intelligence, a couple of people that could calculate math faster than anyone else. And so you had a very productive meeting. And then there was this one person and my God, it was a hassle, right? They'd be sitting in the room. They'd be going, oh, what about this? And what about that? Well, what if this didn't happen? And it's kind of like, can you just give it a rest a little bit so we can get the work done, right? Well, the reason I said it's 30 years ago is because then came Microsoft Excel. I obviously wanted to pick an, uh, an example close to the uh, to the audience here. And as you can imagine, with Microsoft Excel, all those uh, columns and rows were already predefined. So all the market intelligence inputs would come in automatically before you could actually update a number. It would actually calculate the whole spreadsheet faster. You could actually, faster than you could finish the sentence. So what happens in that environment? The two people that were fantastic at bringing on this market intelligence, they're relevant, right? But a lot of that gets automated over time, certainly with ChatGPT or GPT and, uh, and other uh, forms, you can extract the data really quickly. The people that did the math, they were crucial to the meeting. Actually, if two of them couldn't attend, they'd cancel the meeting. Well, all of a sudden, they're obsolete. They're not even in the mix anymore because you don't need the skill set. The one person that was asking those hard questions and saying, what if this, what if that? Guess what? That person is the most important person in the team now because they're figuring out how to orchestrate, in this case, automation, but more broadly, AI. They're figuring out the questions that need to be answered. And so I just want to bring focus back to the fact that, yes, we need more data scientists. Yes, we need more AI engineers. And But actually, the world, in my mind, doesn't really need more of those. They need business people that understand how to apply you know, the uh, technology to the domain, AI to their business nuances. And I think that's where the next set of opportunities are. Anyway, coming back to your question, Suraj. Look, I think deeply about this uh, on the venture side of my role because, um, you know, I go through so many due diligences and looking at uh, new startups that are coming through. And this is an early hypothesis. I don't think it's baked in any level of uh, research or anything like that, but it's a gut feel. And I think there's four areas that will eventually emerge for how AI will be bought or used by you and I. I think the first one is LLMs. And obviously we have a few LLMs in place, but that's actually gonna, um, that's I think going to uh, accelerate because the next chapter in LLMs is actually LLMs that are domain specific. So not just large language model, but large language model for medical and not just for medical, but for drug discovery and not just for drug discovery, but for cell therapy, right? So you're gonna have to keep going down and training this to be able to get the right advantage. So there's a set of companies that I think will come through and will be the beneficiaries of that in the long run. So that's one area of sort of investment, innovation and things to come. In the second one, and this one um, I feel um, is going to happen sooner than later, and it's the point that I think Glenn was making, you have to mix and match a bunch of these different things. So you need a GitHub sort of a place that you can go to. It's an open space source repository. You pull in an ML routine, you pull in some generative AI that is specific to the purpose you're looking at. You bring in some visuals or a CV and a computer vision into it, and you mix and match and you build that. And I don't think that's quite happened, but I actually think that'll be a second area of investment, of innovation, and therefore, you know, place that we'll be uh, extracting value from. The third area I actually think is going to be capabilities that actually integrate and orchestrate different components of technology. 
So the sales forecasting example that I gave you use machine learning. It uses generative AI. It uses computer vision to be able to read it off of PDFs and convert to text. It uses a bunch of different things. And you know, if you and I and all of us just sat down and started hand cobbling each of these components to build a value chain, which is really what I need, it's actually very hard to do. And so there's going to be, um, I think, companies and startups that will come through that will actually seamlessly pull it together into an orchestrated value chain so you and I can put it into use. And then I think the fourth area in this we're seeing today already is um, the ISVs or the current existing software providers will integrate generative AI into their application itself. And so for you and I, as an example, you know, we don't have to go outside of, I'm going to pick, put Excel as an example. I don't, I don't need to speak about vendors. Um, and instead of then sort of coming out and going to somewhere else, you'll have that integrated into that, into that application. And so I actually think there's four segments. Um, there's different levels of capitals that are going in right now and each have a different investment return profile. But I think the level of the pace of innovation is actually the slowest it'll ever be. And, and we'll see some great things come out from each of those. We people. have kind of started talking about the challenges in terms of talent availability and, uh, and, and so on. And, and there's a comment here in chat from Nag, Nag, uh, Nagaraja on, um, on, on regulation. And uh, especially, Alexandra, you 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 have deep insight into banks, and it's one of the the most regulated industries in the world. Um, give us a little bit of sense, maybe, of that interaction. Clearly, like you know, it's it's not the first time that regulation is going to lag uh, uh, the the technology. What yeah, do you I mean, see? Uh, what, two th what, two th what, yeah, two things. I mean, first of all, before before answering the question on regulation. I don't know how much, I mean, it was interesting to see the White House summoning the tech CEOs oh, yeah. of the sort of developing and sort of who wasn't there. Not so much that Meta wasn't there, but it was more the open source uh, generators of large language models that make it accessible, uh, which is where, you know, on the one hand, it's great. It democratizes um, the tool and it's not just held by a few, although you would say, you could say that they are different, you know, what Alpaca is versus what a chat GPT is. But it is, um, you know, it's, uh, of course, it's a good starting point um, to talk to to the big companies that are that are building these tools and releasing them. Because, of course, a lot lies on their in their hands in terms of how they're built and like what they're releasing and accountability and they can be audited and checked if that's where the regulation goes. But what, what do regulators... What what's what are they what, what are they worrying about? What's the what's the concerns in, in your in your well I mean they're, they're worried. I mean they're worried about a bunch of things in terms of, you know, first of all is data privacy and there's IP questions, there are safety issues and there's sort of questions around, you know, that there actually there's a very little understanding of what happens inside large language models. I mean, there's a sense, but it doesn't always, you know, there's a lot of variation there. So the question is what can it do long term? Uh, and what have you stack? large language models on top of each other what is it going to but then there's a question i think the sort of what came out of the commentary of the the white house meetings was that that's that's only looking at a very you know it's looking at um a part of the issue where the open source any actor can get access to them and use use them as they will and how are you then going to build in accountability so i think that is where look at is one step forward that they're beginning to talk about this but it is really far from actually having something concrete in terms of a regulatory framework now. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is that with banks being so heavily regulated already to begin with, there is almost a framework built in there that it's um, that could be used maybe as a as a blueprint for how how regulation could look like in the future. Now, um, there's a lot of challenges with the onboarding of of large language models, but there's also already a lot of oversight uh, model risk. Um, there's, there's, you know, and, and these oversights and, you know, management of risk and models are being adapted to incorporate the specific risks that AI bring. And there's a, there's a, there's a you know, there's a lot of um, focus on that from the banks. I think there's more other sectors that I would be worried about, but banks have to grapple with this. And as there are, you know, yeah, there are definitely challenges with with where this um, with the monitoring of large language models. So yeah. So, so the medical industry might be one where the frameworks probably aren't as clear because the, 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 there isn't like one 
uh, or, or the, the regulatory framework might be less developed than, 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 than banks, but mm -hmm. potential for harm, uh, potential for good is great, but potential for harm might be great uh, right. as, as well. Glenn, sounds like you were going to jump in. Yeah, like I, uh, so this is, this is a big part of the conversation on the, on the corporate side as well. So think about a SOC 1 audit. Like think about in, in, where any of your software is being looked at and the uh, interpretability of what is being done in these models. I mean, if you've got a black box generating that nobody can knows what's going on in there. So and think a SOC about, 1 audit, Glenn, for people who might not know is... It's a system and what system and organization controls audit where it focuses on um, any any systems that are used that could uh, have an impact on uh, yeah. an entities financial reporting basically so um, thinking about the way these models work if you've got to explain the data data and be able to explain the model I mean and run it through rigorous testing and validation and everything that you have to do for this audit. I mean, what's they're going to have to modify this audit to be able to deal with AI to begin with, because how many firms that are using this are going to have the deep AI engineers who can explain how this works? Um, you know, but every company is going to have to have, as Sanjay alluded to earlier, established and communicated um, acceptable use policies, people who are overseeing that and uh, controls that are in place. So this is, it's, we're, it's going to be a while before I would think before regular regulatory bodies can get a handle on this and and figure it out. And I I would think even well maybe not more so, but it equally so for banks. Yeah, the the, the audit function itself. No, that that's that's a great point. Explainability is actually really hard. Even even OpenAI or Microsoft or Google actually won't be able to explain uh, what 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 the generative AI model is actually doing and why why it is uh, doing so. That's the whole sort of um and and so if you know if explainability is a, is a big issue then that becomes a uh, that becomes an issue Sanjay, there's a there's a question that seemed a little sort of at least picked up on something that you talked about so money money here is is asking about just you know given the pace of change how do you I, I guess the summary of the question as i'm understanding is how do you i mean do you just wait before you invest because any investment you're making might might go obsolete um so i mean it's, it's kind of a standard question on on, on, on when when to adopt the technology given the next generation is coming. But that that question has gotten like even more accelerated because like you said, if it's like every day it's changing, then should I like should I just what do I do in terms of investing? Um in, in, I think, if uh, I'm a CFO. It's a great question, uh, Suraj. And, and look, I mean, it's you also have to define invest in what. And so I think we have to take a broader lens than just generative AI. And the three things that quickly come to mind, and I know you're probably running out of time. I think the first one is we have to understand that efficiency and productivity are two different things, right? The fact that I have a good solution to a cold start problem, and therefore I'm more efficient because I have something to start uh, iterating on, versus I'm actually able to do some now, um, the number of hours on spend on something else and put it to some other productive use, right? They're two different things. And this is large implications because you have to start thinking about how do you pick the right business cases to go after? So I'm just saying, even if we get a generative AI, figure out what the use case is, right? And the other thing to keep in mind is that automation and transformation are two entirely different things. Automation being, you know, you take an end-to-end -end process, you break it to its parts, takes every single part, you apply generative AI or any other techniques or automation AI analytics, and you automate it, you pull it back together and you've got something that's faster, cheaper, better, quicker. Awesome, it's not transformation. Transformation is about reimagining what the value is. That is about reimagining what the process runs like. It's rethinking the value chain. It's rethinking the experience the customer gets, the moments that they share with you. And in so doing, then you bring in the new emerging technologies to actually be able to reimagine and re-engineer that process. And in the, the key point in this is once you're done with it, obviously you've automated it, but what you've done is you actually transformed it. And the one thing that falls out of that is the work that's done by human colleagues before I just did this thing, to now what needs to be done is entirely different. So there's a large component of reskilling, resourcing, operating model, process design, API integration. And so start thinking about culturally, how do you approach generative AI? How do you build a foundation in the company and a culture of trust and change and uh, nim being nimble and agile and being able to adapt? And if you get those basics in place, it doesn't matter if you jump into generative AI today or tomorrow, Whenever you do, you'll be much better set up for it. Oh, and I missed one thing, data. 
You know, the number one driver of durable advantage, I think in the long run is going to increasingly become proprietary data. And the reason for that is simple. I mean, yeah, we're talking about AI and it's kind of a lot in the news right now, but in the end, it's going to be a commodity piece of software. It really will be a commodity. The thing that's going to differentiate you as a bank uh, or as a firm or as a corporation is how you apply that to proprietary data in a way that your competitors can't. And so building a foundation of data, getting that right, getting the governance, the master data management, the data platforms, I think those things become key. So anyways, quick answer, but you know, look, when you and your company jumps into generative AI, I'm going to leave to you and maybe we can talk offline, et cetera. But I can't specifically address that, not knowing the context, but the time is now to invest in the foundation because if you don't build it now, you won't get to it tomorrow. And I think that was what Alexandra, you were talking about in, you know, er early on as, as you are talking to all the banks about getting the plumbing, like the basic plumbing in, 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 in place. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, as, as you do this. But, but yeah. it also, well, one comment on that, I know we have 30 seconds left, but I think that it all comes down to that culture build comes from the top. I mean, there's a lot of bottom up work that's going on right now and it's super important, but you don't get the culture of it doesn't, it isn't, it isn't a priority at the leadership level. Otherwise, it doesn't change. Anyway, sorry, Suraj. No, no, no. That, that's so, so. So, in the in the less than a minute that we have, maybe one parting thought from each each of you on uh, uh, um, maybe Alexandra kind of already well, kicked us off yeah. on that. You know, it has yeah, to start was, from the top. It's not it's yeah not leadership. That, yeah, you go leadership. That's that's Alexandra's like one one big takeaway here. Uh, uh, maybe Glenn and, and Sanjay, one quick thought as we as we wrap this up in, in terms of like what should people be thinking about as as we think about the next steps in uh, in, in generative AI in finance. Yeah, I guess my quick one would be, and, and this is a repeat of what Sanjay said again, but data is the foundation. Data is the fuel that's going to drive all this. And the real differentiators are going to be the people who have, you know, look at who drove AI. The, the early moves were the people who had all the data, Google, Facebook, Meta, um, Amazon, you know, th those were the people who were able to um, drive the early part of it. And that's going to continue. There is more data out there now. So there's, you know, more people will be able to have it, but that is data maturity before AI, I guess was my closing thought. Oh, well, this is, this is, this is similar to, you know, all the discussion you have about content and, and the news media, you know, news media is going to get irrelevant because, you know, you can get your news on Facebook. New York times is bigger than it ever was um, uh, because, you know, the content creators are still kings in that, in that space. Sanjay, parting thought from you. Learn, unlearn, and relearn. It's, uh, <laughs> black words from my manager, uh, who's the CEO of our company. He says this all the time, and I've taken that to heart. And I think it's something all of us can do. Um, this game is changing. The pace of change is the slowest it'll ever be. And we have to learn and then unlearn. And I mean that, unlearn and relearn. Now, if you're not doing that, you're not taking that. That's going to be the motto of, of, of the lab now going, going forward, uh, Sanjay. Learn, unlearn, relearn. And then that's what we, we try to do here at, uh, at, at DQ. I can't say how much uh, I, I can't uh, how much I enjoyed this. Um, so and and and, and learned a ton. Obviously, m way more questions at this stage uh, than than there are answers. But you have teed up uh, several of them uh, for us and tons more uh, in, in in chat. So I'm deeply grateful to all the all the participants. Hopefully, you know, fired some synapses in your brains on on, on ways of thinking. Uh, a huge thanks to you, Alexandra, to you, Glenn, to you, Sanjay, for for sharing your thoughts. I know we'll be in touch, but uh, for, for this panel, it's minute past one. Uh, and so, so we'll, uh, with, with huge thanks, we'll bid goodbye for now. Thank you.